It's WNYC. Stay with us. Marketplace is next. On the show tonight, during the pandemic, a lot of new businesses cropped up out in the suburbs. As you get further away from the downtown area, there are actually buildings that you can uh, not only lease at a reasonable price, but actually acquire um, and ultimately build equity. The development donut. That's next on Marketplace at 630. We'll have more all things considered at 7 p.m. 67 degrees sunny out there. Should stay clear tonight. We'll have a low somewhere around 58 degrees. It's WNYC at 630. WNYC supporters include the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, presenting when extremist ideas are no longer considered extreme, June 6th at the Paley Center for Media in New York City. Details at ushmm.org. This is WNYC, 93.9 FM and AM 820, NPR News and the New York Conversation. Marketplace is supported by DTN, with operational intelligence fueling optimal business decisions worldwide. DTN's data and analytics help eliminate decision dead zones. Learn more at DTN.com slash OI. Debt limit. There. I said it. Didn't want to. Kind of had to. From American Public Media, this is Marketplace. Marketplace is supported by Slash Next, generative human AI security that stops business email compromise and mobile phishing scams. Businesses can compare Slash Next with their current solutions for 30 days at SlashNext.com. And by Raymond James, tailored wealth management, banking, and capital markets solutions for clients' unique needs. Disclosures at RaymondJames.com. In Los Angeles, I'm Kai Rizdal. It is Tuesday today, the 30th of May. Good as always to have you along, everybody. Believe me when I tell you I tried to avoid using the most overused macroeconomic phrase of at least the past couple of weeks as a way into our lead story today. But honestly, there is just no way not to say debt limit when you're talking about things that are dragging on this economy. Not the actual nuts and bolts deal that may or may not get done in the next... Sorry, sorry, just checking the calendar. Yep, six days. Because honestly, big picture, it's not really going to do that much. Rather, I am speaking about the drag on the American consumer, who is already dealing with inflation and the Fed and interest rates and the recessiony vibes that are out there. So it should come as little surprise that in a reading out today from the conference board, we learned consumer confidence slipped a little bit in May. And if you dig into the data, as we are wont to do around these parts from time to time, you will see that those over age 55 are feeling especially glum. Marketplace's Stephanie Hughes gets us going. 79-year-old Patricia Brooks was headed to the bingo game when I caught her outside a senior center in southeast Baltimore. She wasn't playing for big bucks. Just a couple cents. Uh, That's all we have. You know, nickels, pennies. (laughs) When Brooks was younger, she worked as a nanny and in retail, nothing that helped her save towards retirement. Now, living off of only Social Security makes her feel like the economy is doing terribly. We try to keep our homes as nice as we can, we try to buy our groceries, but it's hard. You have other bills, you got a rough time with it. And medical, oh my lord, medical is so high. A few blocks over, 69-year-old Michael Engler is out for his daily walk. He's not worried about his economic future after selling his financial planning and investment company. (laughs) It's a good business to be in, yes. (laughs) I finally got tired of it. But he isn't super optimistic about the economy as a whole. I think uh, the job market is strong, but interest rates are higher, so buying a house is more difficult. People are calling for a recession later this year. People over age 55 are markedly more pessimistic than younger people, according to the Consumer Confidence Survey. They have less time left to earn or save money and have had more time to accrue debt. Ottoman Ozil Durham is a senior director at the conference board. He's almost 53 and says he gets it. When I was in in my 30s, I rarely looked at my retirement uh, portfolio or the balance. But being over 50, now I'm thinking that my time horizon is shorter and I probably need to pay a little bit more attention. It kind of, uh, you know, focuses the mind. In some ways, how you feel about the economy in your 60s and 70s depends on how things went in earlier decades. In Baltimore, I'm Stephanie Hughes for Marketplace. 
On Wall Street today, traders old and young were just kind of hanging out, not paying much mind to anything, I think. We'll have the details when we do the numbers. We talked about this a little bit as it was happening, that the number of people applying to start new businesses in this economy really spiked in the months after the pandemic started. It has settled down a bit since then, but the rate of new business formation, that's the official term, new business formation, is still a lot higher than it was in the before times. And that's in the face of, and stop me if you've heard this before, a still really tight labor market and inflation, the interest rate hikes, and the recessions worrying this economy continues to face. Interestingly... A lot of that new business formation is about where they are popping up. Most specifically, not in downtowns and central business districts. Marketplace's Justin Ho takes us about 20 miles north of downtown San Diego. I'm standing in a parking lot right off the 5 freeway in an office park that's home to a handful of businesses. From here, you can see a law firm, uh, annex of a hospital, some medical practices, uh, a bank. Nathan Raggi is the CEO of that bank. It's called First Pacific Bank, and he points out that it's not just offices around here. There's a grocery store, a gym, a hardware store, a taco shop. And then outside of that, then there are literally thousands of homes. In other words, we're in the suburbs. Raggi's bank has been in this location for about a year, and he says compared to downtown, working out here has a lot of advantages. For one, it's close to home. Raggi lives about 10 minutes away. There's plenty of parking, and when you step inside, here we go. You can see that the building itself is pretty new. All the finishes are updated. Technology's here. You don't have any issues of obstructions for Wi-Fi or, or that you have a lack of access to technology. Uh, people enjoy or feel better about coming to a, a building that they're comfortable with. Raggi says it's a lot harder to find a place like this downtown, at least at the same price. His bank lends to a lot of small and medium-sized businesses that have set up shop in places just like this. And he says affordability is a big draw. As you get further away from the downtown area, there are actually buildings that you can uh, not only lease at a reasonable price, but actually acquire um, and ultimately build equity. Last year, the downtown office vacancy rate rose above the vacancy rate in the suburbs for the first time since 1998, according to the property services company, CBRE. Nicholas Bloom, a professor at Stanford, calls this the donut effect. This is the classic American donut. People have left the center and moved out to the ring. Bloom says it's not just medium-sized businesses like First Pacific Bank. It's also tiny businesses, side hustles owned by people who work from home. Imagine I wanted to, I don't know, sell, you know, World War II memorabilia. I could start the thing up when I'm working from home, do a few sales on the side. If it really takes off, eventually I'll maybe leave my job. And starting a business that way, Bloom says, is about as affordable as it gets. So rather than needing to, you know, go to the bank or go to friends or family and borrow, let's say, $20,000, you can start it for free in your, in your home. Businesses are starting up in the suburbs for another reason. Businesses and entrepreneurs are going to go where the opportunity is, right? That's Karen Kerrigan, CEO of the Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council. Populations in the suburbs are growing faster than in urban cores, according to an analysis of census data by the Brookings Institution. That's a lot of customers and consumers to cater to with any type of business. We haven't necessarily seen big commercial real estate developers start responding to this population shift, says Richard Barkham, CBRE's global chief economist. At the moment, we've got elevated interest rates and we've got uh, an economy that's slowing. So we may well see some new real estate investment in the suburbs, but it, it isn't happening immediately. Some smaller businesses aren't waiting. One of those is Day's Delicious Dogs, a food truck in Columbia, South Carolina. So we sell hot dogs, nachos, fries, popcorn, cotton candy, ices. Sierra Jenkins is the owner. She had the idea to open a hot dog food truck early in the pandemic, and she finally did it last year. Jenkins says she had no interest in opening up downtown, in large part because that would have meant a lot of red tape. Just being close up in the city is like you always just on your toes because you never know how they're going to feel about the next move you make. A food truck, she says, gives her more freedom to go to her customers, whether they're at a street festival or just working from home. 
We are able to go in neighborhoods and set up so people don't have to leave their home and travel. It's just like us bringing it to their front doors. Jenkins says she'd love to open up a brick and mortar shop someday, but it won't be in a busy urban center. I'm Justin Ho for Marketplace. The jobs report for May comes out this Friday, and once the headline numbers are digested, economists and analysts and journalists are going to start digging into the data. And one of the things we're going to be looking for is what's going on in the labor market for black Americans. In April, the unemployment rate for black workers in this economy hit 4.7 percent, the lowest on record. And the unemployment gap between black and white Americans hit 1.6 percentage points, also the lowest on record. So we have gotten Michelle Holder on the phone. She's a labor economist at John Jay College at the City University of New York to talk things over. Dr. Holder, nice to have you back. Nice to be back. Thank you so much, Kai. When you saw uh, that black unemployment in this economy was at record lows, what did you think? Well, my first thought was, yay. (laughs) My first thought was, (laughs) This is this is great. Um, my first feelings were, I have to admit, celebratory. Okay, I, I don't want to. I don't want to rain on the parade. But I wonder if your second thought was, uh oh. Uh yeah, <laughs> actually yeah. it was. So yeah. I uh, quickly sort of regrouped and said, well, let me dig deeper uh, into mm-hmm. the numbers. And uh, you know, a couple of things. Um, The first is Mm -hmm. that uh, there was a decline in the labor force participation rate among black workers. Now, you know, I will say that that is part of really a secular trend in terms of a declining labor force participation rate in this country. Not necessarily uh, surprised by that, but there was a real discernible decline. But the other thing is, well, what are the jobs that it, that's really right. driving this decline in the unemployment rate. And I have to say that the quality of jobs that is kind of, you know, pushing uh, this unemployment rate to such a low level is not that great. Can we separate here for a second, Michelle, black men versus black women? Because, you know, we've been talking now for th- literally three years uh, with you uh, about these kinds of things. And, and, from early on, we talked about black women, and I want to get back to them, but I want to talk first of all about about black men and, and their labor force participation rate and what kinds of jobs they are getting. Absolutely. So what's really uh, been behind these numbers is uh, increase in job holding among black men in the labor market. And so let me be specific. Of the three million more jobs that the U.S. economy has now than it did in February 2020, a third of those jobs is in the transportation and warehousing uh, industry. Mm -hmm. That industry is the industry that has the best representation in terms of black male workers. The problem is the transportation and warehousing sector is a low wage sector. Right. Okay, so so black men getting jobs but not great jobs. What about black women? Because early on in our series of conversations we talked about centering black women in this economy, how much more fundamental they are actually than women of most other uh, races and ethnic categories to this to, to the security of their families. So what about black women? Sure. So black women are for the most part back to where we were, but it took us longer. And also, uh, we're not necessarily the reason why the black unemployment rate is so low. The industries in which we are concentrated, which includes public sector work, it includes right. leisure and hospitality, and it particularly includes education and, and social services, those sectors really took much longer to recover. And in fact, um, public sector employment has not completely recovered. And so it's ironic that on the one hand, in terms of the change in the industrial industrial mix uh, of our economy, it benefited black men, but it didn't benefit black women. Right, right, right. Okay, so so let's frame this now in the situation we are in, in the situation that 
uh, we're about to be in for the next, you know, six to 18 months in this economy. The federal inflation is still a factor coming down, but still a factor. Thus, the Federal Reserve is going to probably keep interest rates where they are for some time. We know that higher interest rates hit people at the lower end of the economic spectrum harder. And so and, and they lose, frankly, when when interest rates are high and economy is slow. So are black workers in this economy positioned better now because of the gains or are they still um, uh, disproportionately vulnerable? Uh, I would have to say they're vulnerable. If the job market really begins to contract, it's mm-hmm. going to be uh, workers of color, black, Latinx. It's going to be workers with lower levels of education, and it's going to be younger workers. And so the gains that have really been experienced by um, black workers, particularly black men, it's it's quite vulnerable because right. black men are well represented in those industries and that are uh, vulnerable to business cyclicality. Michelle Holder, she's an associate professor of economics at John Jay College at the City University of New York. Michelle, thanks a lot. Really good to talk to you. Same here. Thanks so much, Kyle. Coming up. I was joking a lot with my friends. Like, I guess we should probably think of some hobbies. I mean, it can't hurt, right? First, though, let's do the numbers. Dow Industrial's down 50 points, five zero points, one tenth of one percent, 33,042. NASDAQ went the other way, 41 points, three tenths percent to the good, 13,017. The SP 500 basically unchanged, 42 and five. We heard from Stephanie Hughes that consumer confidence has dipped to a six-month low, even though people are continuing to shop, travel, and go out to eat one of the many conundra facing people trying to figure out what's going on in this economy. Some popular spending categories, Marriott dipped 1.5%. Darden Restaurants, which owned Olive, owns rather Olive Garden, was off a half percent. Nordstrom grew 1 and 7 tenths of 1% today. Bonds rose, yield on the 10-year T-note down, 3.69%. You are listening to Marketplace. The numbers is supported by Odoo, open source business apps that cover your company needs. Marketplace is supported by Fortra, a software company dedicated to simplifying today's complex cybersecurity landscape by bringing complementary products together to solve problems in innovative ways. Learn more at fortra.com. And by Amazon Business. From small business to big enterprise and everything in between, Amazon Business helps simplify the supplies buying process. Amazon Business, your partner for smart business buying. Support for WNYC comes from Bank of America, offering access to resources and digital tools designed to help local to global companies make moves for their businesses. Learn more at bankofamerica.com slash banking for business. Hurricane Ian killed 150 people. The storm that ravaged part of South Florida last fall could have been even more deadly if not for advances in forecasting. But many people in the path underestimated the storm surge. You've got to stop focusing on the wrong things. What scientists are looking out for at the start of another hurricane season on the next morning edition from NPR News. Weekday mornings on WNYC. You're listening to Marketplace on WNYC. In the 7 o'clock hour of All Things Considered, it's been five years since the U.S. pulled out of the nuclear deal with Iran. How close is Iran now to a bomb? What can the U.S. do to stop them? And how are regional and global shifts changing the equation? We'll have that and more at 7 o'clock. Stay tuned. This is Marketplace. I'm Kai Rizdal. Crude oil today, the international benchmark of Brent North Sea. Closed down a little bit more than 4% on this Tuesday, which I mentioned not for the price point, but as a reminder that oil is a global market, so you squeeze the balloon in one place, it pops out in another. And that gets us to some analysis that Bloomberg has done about how effective the West's sanctions on Russian oil have been. It seems Saudi Arabia has been buying up Russian diesel and then selling more of the stuff they refine themselves. Marketplace's Lily Jamali explains what's going on there. What the Saudis are doing is pretty simple, says Matt Smith of the data and analytics firm Kepler. They're not doing it just from the goodness of their own heart. They're able to take this cheap material, consume it domestically, and then export their own at a market price, which will be much higher. 
The kingdom started buying Russian diesel in February after the EU banned the fuel, Smith says. Now it's buying around 180,000 barrels of Russian diesel every day. Russia is struggling to find a home for its refined products and needs to so that it can keep its revenues up. And so from that perspective, Saudi Arabia is really stepping up and, and helping them on this front. Buying Russian diesel is legal, says Karen Young, senior research scholar at Columbia's Center on Global Energy Policy. After all, the goal of Western sanctions was to cap the price of Russian energy, not to prevent it from reaching the global market. It was to continue to get that product out so that we wouldn't have a global shortage and the price go you know, through the roof for the rest of us. The West, she says, is playing the long game. This use of sanctions and a price cap was not intended to stop or cease the Russian energy business. Instead, sanctions are taking aim at Russia's energy sector a different way. You're not going to see any, any investment going into the Russian oil and gas industry, so it will be debilitated over time. But for now, the West is left with an in-between approach on Russian energy, says Ellen Wald of the Atlantic Council. If you really want to cut off all of Russia's money, then this, is, this policy is not really working. Wald says a full embargo could work, but it would be pretty hard to sell to the American people. I'm Lily Jamali for Marketplace. We did a story last week about tourists returning to cities in their travels after a couple of three years of choosing the great outdoors in the pandemic. And people are going back to cities, but there was something else interesting in that story, too. Domestic tourists are back in places like Las Vegas, but the number of tourists coming from outside the country is still lower than it was before the pandemic, which prompted these questions from the mind of Marketplace's Henry App. When might those international travelers start coming back? and what is holding them back. This slow return of foreign visitors tracks with what Kenneth Lippman is seeing on the Segway and e-bike tours he runs in L.A., San Diego, and Las Vegas, but it's a whole lot better than a couple years ago. Our international business was nil. It really dropped off of a cliff. Now, his customer base of Brits, Canadians, and Australians are coming back. Still, even when travel restrictions started lifting... It wasn't the very next day that people were traveling. It's taking time for them to plan their itineraries. Getting a visa to the U.S. if you need one is also taking time, says Jeff Freeman, president and CEO of the U.S. Travel Association. Current wait times in places like Brazil, India, Mexico, Colombia are 500 days or more just to get an interview at a U.S. consulate. The State Department has stepped up efforts to bring those times down, but Freeman says the backlog is leading deep-pocketed international tourists to take their money elsewhere. The truth is that other countries around the world are aggressively competing to attract those travelers. Also, it hasn't been all that long since countries like China and Japan dropped COVID restrictions, says Alex Dichter, head of the global travel practice at McKinsey. You don't take two years and in some cases, three years of deferred travel plans and execute them all you know, over the course of a single year. That could mean a period of revenge travel from international visitors. I'm Henry App for Marketplace. With the soon-to-be-upon-us end of graduation season, both high school and college, attention turns to the job market. And as we've been saying for a while now, one of the big things the Fed is trying to do with all its interest rate increases is cool down that labor market, which can have a disproportionate effect on people entering the labor force for the first time. So we are doing a mini-series within our series, My Economy, about how some new graduates are feeling. My name is Zoe Bennett. I'm from Portland, Oregon, and I just graduated from the University of Alabama. And this June, I'm going to start working as an environmental engineer at International Paper in Rome, Georgia. 
just talking to like my parents who when I accepted my job offer they were so excited for me and I think they think that it's a lot more money than it is maybe they're right and I am more secure than I think I am but it just there's so many little expenses and budgeting it's not horrible like I'm not worried about not managing it it's just so many little things I was feeling pretty comfortable and excited about my salary. And then I was watching these TikToks of people like interviewing others on the street saying, oh, what do you do? How much do you make? Things like that. And that honestly, I feel like made me feel worse. There's just not very many sources to get that information from. And I feel like especially, you know, in college, I don't think I ever had a professor or a mentor or a club or anyone really talk about numbers very much, maybe briefly, but that wasn't a big emphasis. So there's only so many places that people talk about that. And I guess TikTok's one of them for better or worse. Moving to a new place, especially a small town where I don't know a single person except for the people that I'm going to work with, it's, it's definitely intimidating. I was joking a lot with my friends, like, I guess we should probably think of some hobbies. Like, <laughs> I think, you know, in college, we're always so busy and doing random stuff that when people ask, like, oh, what are your hobbies? You kind of have to stop and think about all the little things that you kind of have to do to establish yourself in a new place where there aren't these, you know, already set up things to meet people and make friends. One year from now, I'm hoping to feel stable both economically but also just in all aspects of life and you know enjoying my job and having a new life i don't know that sounds dramatic but there is something about going to work every day and then going home and doing it all again that's intimidating and so i'm hoping that i have i have a balanced life It is indeed intimidating. Zoe Bennett now in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, soon to be in Rome, Georgia, with her first job out of college. And while we do hope that your life is balanced, we would like to hear from you, even if it's not. Let us know how things are going. Would you? Marketplace.org slash myeconomy. This final note on the way out today, housing news this time. The gold standard S&P Case-Shiller Home Price Index came out today. Nationally, home prices in March this year were seven-tenths of a percent higher than in March of last year. That is the second straight month of increases. Here is the quote from S&P. Two months of increasing prices do not a definitive recovery make, but the March results suggest the decline in home prices that began in June 2022 may have come to an end. Marketplace is supported by Extend, turning credit cards into spend management tools so businesses can control payments with virtual cards. More at paywithextend.com. And by Financially Inclined, a podcast from Marketplace is all about money lessons for living life your own way. Listen to Financially Inclined wherever you get your podcasts. All right, off we go on this Tuesday. Here, though, your moment of economic context. Just to close the loop on a story that Matt Levin did for us last week, artificial intelligence as a business opportunity. NVIDIA, the chip design company working real hard on AI, was for a brief moment or two today worth a trillion dollars. Now, a trillion dollars in market cap and five bucks will get you a cup of coffee in this economy, but it is kind of interesting, I think. Our digital and on-demand team includes Carrie Barber, Dylan Mithin, and Janet Wynn, Olga Oxman, Ellen Rolfes, Virginia K. Smith, and Tony Wagner. Francesca Levy is the executive director. I'm Kai Rizdal. We will see you tomorrow, everybody. This is APM.
WNYC is supported by Bill. Bill automates financial operations for small to mid-sized businesses and helps to create and pay 